have an odd way of sometimes, as it were, being able to see myself through someone else's eyes. Then I view the affairs of a certain Anne at my ease and browse through the pages of her life as if she were a stranger. It was the last daylight hour of a December afternoon more than 20 years ago. I was 23, writing and publishing my first short stories, when I arrived at his hideaway in the Berkshires to meet the great man. In this 19th century New England farmhouse, E.I. Lonoff had written his seven books of short stories. An orphan, an immigrant child to begin with, Lonoff had married the daughter of an old Massachusetts family and oddly, for a Jew of his generation, had lived for 35 years as a recluse in the country. Hello. I'm Nathan Zuckerman. I'm glad you found us. Hi, ho. Here tonight's report. 20 below and plenty of snow. Hello, Marie. Manny, 20 below and plenty of snow. <laughs> come in, come in. I'm Nathan Zuckerman. Yeah, this is... Uh... <clears throat> now, how would you prefer to be addressed? Nathan, Nate, Nat, or do you have another preference entirely? Nathan. Uh, my friends call me Manny, and you must do the same. It'll make conversation easier. I doubted that. No. The master proceeded to undo me further by asking to hear something about my life. Where you were born. Well, there wasn't much to report about my life in 1956. Um, I just got out of the army. I've got an apartment in New York. Uh, before I was drafted, I was at the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. and that's where I first began to read you. I started with It's Your Funeral and then read everything straight through. To me, when I first read you, it was as though the hallucinatory strains of Gogol had been somehow filtered through the humane skepticism of Chekhov. Relax, Nathan. It's not necessary. What did you do in the army? You were in Korea? No. Uh, I typed for two years at Fort Dix. I was a clerk. At night, I wrote stories. Uh, two of the stories I sent you, the two in the Atlantic. And now? How do you make ends meet? Your family? No, I'm independent of them. Uh, I sell magazines. It's a job I had summers in college. Right now, of course, I'm staying at Coise at the Artist Colony. They've invited me to stay for six weeks. That's where I wrote to you from. I was stunned when you replied. Uh, which magazines do you sell? Uh, Photoplay, Silver Screen, Modern Romance. Suppose I'd been a potential customer and I'd opened my door. What would you have said to me? 
Um, well, I, uh, um, when you open the door, uh, I'd say, uh, hello. Uh, it was difficult to talk. believe that what I was doing merely to support myself until I began to write, as he did all the time, could possibly be of interest to E.I. Lanoff. I was amazed by his propriety, this sober, conventional, unspectacular front. The great E.I. Lonoff looked, sounded, and acted more like the local high school principal than the region's most original storyteller since Melville and Hawthorne. It would allow me to get in, and after you'd had the chance to look at it, I'd say uh, that if you bought Collier's at the newsstand, it would cost you 35 cents a copy, which is in itself a bargain. I wish I knew that much about selling magazines. I wish I knew that much about anything. I've written fantasy for 30 years. Nothing happens to me. I turn sentences around. I write a sentence, then I turn it around. Then I look at it, then I turn it around again. Then I have lunch. Then I come back in and write another sentence. And then I have tea and turn the new sentence around. Then I read the two sentences over and turn them both around. Then I lie down on my sofa and think. And then I get up and throw them out and start from the beginning. What you teach at Athena College? Going down to the college is the high point of my week. I carry a briefcase. I wear a hat. I nod hello to the people on the staircase. I use a public toilet. Ask Hope. I come home reeling from the pandemonium. No. No children? No, they're all grown up. Hope and I have been alone for eight years. Who is it? Not the genius again. He just wants to talk to you. Stop fixing me up with intellectuals. I don't think fast enough. Either it's the professional innocence or the deep thinkers. I'd made the journey to Lanos house, hoping in part that it would help to alleviate my depression over a family crisis. Lanoff, through his stories about Jews, had in fact told me more about my family's relentless obsession with the precarious status of the Jewish people than anything I'd carried forward from my New Jersey childhood. Three weeks before my visit to Lanoff, I'd given my father the manuscript of a story I'd finished about Jews, my most ambitious to date. And for the first time in our life as a family, we ceased to be a family. Their exemplary son, to their astonishment, became a source of shame. Well, Nathan, you certainly didn't leave anything out, did you? I left a lot of things out. Things had to be left out. It's only 50 pages. I mean, you didn't leave anything disgusting out. Did I? D didn't I? I wasn't thinking along those lines exactly. My story was based on a family financial feud in which my father had played peacemaker between a hot-headed aunt and a devious uncle. They had ended up shouting in the courtroom of a Gentile judge. You make everybody seem awfully greedy, Nathan. But everybody was. That's one way of looking at it, of course. That's the way you looked at it yourself. That's why you were so upset with Sidney and Esther when they wouldn't compromise. The fact remains, son. There is more to the family, much more than is in this story. Forget Sidney and Esther. Their mother, your great aunt, was as kind and loving and hardworking a woman as you could ever meet in this world. Your, your grandmother and all of her sisters were, every last one of them. They, they were women who thought only of others. But the story is not about them. They are part of the story. They're, they're the whole story, as far as I'm concerned. Without them, there would be no story at all. So 
So what do you do with the story now? Send it to a magazine? It's long for a magazine. Probably no magazine will publish it. Oh, you're on your way. They'll publish it, all right. But from a lifetime of experience, I happen to know what ordinary people will think when they read something like this. And you don't. You can't. You've been sheltered from it all your life. It's not your fault you don't know what Gentiles think when they read something like this. But I can tell you, they don't think about how it's a, a great work of art. People don't read art. They read about people. And how do you think they will judge the people in your story? Have you thought about that? Yes. And what have you concluded? I can't put it into a conclusion. I didn't write 15,000 words, so as now to put it all into a one-word conclusion. Well, I can. Your story, Nathan, as far as Gentiles are concerned, is about one thing and one thing only. It is about kikes. Kikes and their love of money. That is all our good Christian friends will see. I've watched you all your life. You, you are, you're a good, kind, and considerate young man. You aren't somebody who writes this kind of story and then pretends it's a truth. But I did write it. I am the kind of person who writes this kind of story. This is Mr. Zuckerman, the short story writer. This is Miss Bellet. Miss Bellet was once a student here. She's taken it upon herself to sort through my manuscripts. Miss Bellet works for the Harvard Library. She believes there's some reason to deposit with Harvard University the pieces of paper on which I turn my sentences around. I've uh, just found 27 drafts of a single short story. Which story? Life's embarrassing. <sighs> to get it wrong so many times. In class, he used to tell the writing students that there is no life without patience. No one knew what he was talking about. I know I can't wait for anything. But you do. <laughs> bursting with frustration all the while. If you weren't bursting, you wouldn't need patience. Yes, it's slippery. It's deceptive. Is she coming back? Hmm. Off to dinner with our library chief. They wanted to leave Cambridge and work at Athena. I remember being surprised by grown-up Amy's childish hat. In fact, her role of former pupil was as intriguing to me as the facade of the celebrated writer. I was told several times by the Lanoffs that Amy was back for only a few days. She was considering accepting a position as assistant librarian at her old college, Athena, where Lanoff gave his weekly seminars. She has a remarkable prose style. The best student writing I've ever read. Wonderful clarity, wonderful comedy, tremendous intelligence. She wrote stories about the college that capture the place in a sentence. Everything she sees, she takes hold of. Where is she from, originally? She came to us from England. What, the accent? Now, that is from the country of fetching. I don't think I could keep my wits about me teaching in a school with such beautiful and gifted and fetching girls. Then you shouldn't do it. The mornings at the colony, I wake up knowing there are all those empty hours to be filled with work. At the end of the day, I walk in the snow. At night, I read. To a wonderful new writer. I could live like that forever. Oh, don't try it. If your whole life consists of reading, writing, and walking in the snow, you'll wind up like me, fantasy for 30 years. You shouldn't express such a low opinion of your achievement. It's not becoming, and it's not true, darling. I was not measuring my achievement. I was only suggesting that an unruly personal life will probably better serve a writer like Nathan than walking in the woods and startling the deer. His work has turbulence. That should be nourished, and not in the woods. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. I thought you were expressing distaste for your own work. I was expressing distaste, but not for the work. 
I was expressing distaste for the range of my imagination. Your imagination or your experience? I long ago gave up illusions about myself and experience. I never quite know what that means. It means that I know who I am. I know the kind of man I am and the kind of writer. I have my own kind of bravery. And please, let's leave it at that. I'm sorry. Don't apologize. He has the greatest respect for what you're doing, Nathan. We don't have visitors unless they're people Manny respects. The truth is, Hope would have been happier with a less exacting companion. Oh, sweetheart. You must sound so... so unyielding to Nathan, and you're not. You, you're the most forgiving and, and understanding and modest person I've ever known. Too modest. Well, let's forget how I sound and have some more coffee. But you are the kindest person. He is, Nathan. Well, you, you've met Amy, haven't you? Miss Ballette. Well, she wrote him a letter when she was 16 years of age. The most charming, lively letter. It was so daring, so brash. She, she told him her story, but instead of forgetting it, he wrote her back. He always writes people back, a polite note, even to fools. Oh, what was her story? Displaced refugee. She said she wanted a new start in life, and she thought that the man whose wonderful story she'd read in her school anthology... It wasn't an anthology. Oh, but, uh... Continue. I think I can talk about this without help. I'm only relating the facts, and calmly enough, I had thought. Amy is not the subject, not by any means. The subject is your extraordinary kindness and charity. Your concern for anyone in need, anyone except yourself and your needs. Only myself, as you like to call it, happens not to exist in the everyday sense of the word. Consequently, you may stop lavishing praise upon it and worrying about its needs. But yourself does exist. It has a perfect right to exist. Enough. Check me out. I want you to check me out. Don't tell me you can. Because you must. I want you to. I'll finish the dishes and then chuck me out tonight. I beg of you. I'd rather live and die alone. I'd rather endure that than another moment of your bravery. I cannot take any more moral fiber in the face of life's disappointments. Not yours and not mine. I cannot bear having a loyal, dignified husband who has no illusions about himself. Not one second more. Take her, Manny. If you want her, take her. You won't be so miserable and everything in the world won't be so bleak. She's not a student anymore. She is a woman. You're entitled to her. But I cannot take another moment as your jailer. Your nobility is wearing away the last thing that's left. You're a monument. You can take it and take it. And I've got to nothing, darling. I can't. <laughs> Shut me out. Maybe she can glue it.
I think of you as the Jew who got away. Does that make it easier? Well, there's some truth in it, isn't there? You got away from Russia and the pogroms and the purges. You got away from Palestine and the homeland. You got away from Boston and the relatives. Uh, look, uh, you must understand, when you admire a writer, you become curious. You search for his secret, the clues to his puzzle. What's the puzzle? Well, you got away from the Jews, but still, all you ever write about are Jews. A story by you without a Jew in it is as unthinkable as a story by Joyce without an Irishman. Proving what? Well, that's what I'd like to ask you. It proves why the young rabbi over in Pittsfield can't live with the idea that I won't be active in his synagogue. Well, I ought to call that taxi if I'm to catch the late bus to Quesse. Yes. Or if you like, you can stay over and sleep in the study. Well, no, I really ought to be off. Do you know the old Durante number? Did you ever have the feeling that you wanted to go, still have the feeling that you wanted to stay? Well, I wouldn't want to inconvenience your wife. If you leave, she might hold herself responsible. Stay for breakfast, Nathan. Sit down. Hope misses the children and their friends. She wants me to accept an invitation to teach at Harvard. She thinks I might enjoy it in Cambridge. But all I need are those dinner parties. I'd rather talk to the horse. You have a horse? Not yet. All Lonoff had to say was that he did not have the horse, not yet, and somehow that did it released in me a son's love for a father, for a father who understands life, understands the son, and approves. I still have my evening's reading to do. I don't know how to relax. My wife considers this to be a grave affliction. And how else am I to conduct my life? How would you like to? I would live in a villa outside Florence. With whom? With a woman, of course. How old would she be, this woman? We have both had too much to drink. How old would you think she should be? The woman in Florence. I mean, as a writer, what would be your guess? 35? She would be 35 and make life beautiful for me. I'd work in a cool stone room with French windows. There'd be flowers she'd cut in a vase. At the breakfast table, she'd wear a long feminine nightgown under her robe. A present I bought for her in a shop by the Ponte Vecchia. And so on, Nathan, in that vein. That doesn't sound too hard to arrange. Oh, yes? What young woman that you know is out looking for a white-haired old man to accompany to Italy? 
You're hardly the stereotypical white-haired old man of 60. Italy with you wouldn't be Italy with anyone. You mean I'm supposed to cash in my seven books for a piece of ass? No, you don't throw a woman out after 35 years because you prefer to see a new face over your fruit juice. Ah, oh, let me show you before I go how to work the photograph. Uh, Mr. Lanoff. Manny. Could I ask you about my stories? What I'd like to know is what you think is wrong with them. What you think I might do to be better. Look, I told Hope this morning, Zuckerman has the most compelling voice I've encountered in years. Certainly for somebody just starting out. Do I? And I don't mean style. I mean voice. Something that begins uh, at about the back of the knees and reaches way over the head. And don't worry too much about being wrong. Just keep going. You'll get there. Now, let me show you what happens if the arm doesn't go all the way back at the end of the record. Absolutely. It's been acting up lately. Nobody seems able to fix it. The same maddening, meticulous attention to every last detail that had kept him going, someday, someday that had gotten him through, fixes itself. and that formed the bars of his prison. Oh, uh, it's uh, best for the records and for your own pleasure if you remember to give them a wipe first. Good night. Good night. There I was, in Lanoff's study. Yet the problem with my father, the father who really was my father, would not go away. I had never before seen him so sadly bewildered. He was so troubled by the story I had written about the Zuckerman family's unsavory feud that Against the counsel of my mother, he had decided to seek an audience with one of Newark's leading Jewish citizens, Judge Leopold Wapter. Bill, I want you to meet Dr. Zuckerman. Judge Kavanaugh, Dr. Zuckerman. Deeply honored, Judge Kavanaugh. I've admired you ever since I was a boy. The letter I had received from the judge, with a questionnaire attached, was the first I knew of their meeting. Dear Nathan, my familiarity with your fine family, as you must know, goes back to the turn of the century on Prince Street, where we were all poor people in a new land, struggling for our basic needs, our social and civil rights, and our spiritual dignity. Attached, you will find a questionnaire about your story, prepared jointly by my wife and myself. Because of Mrs. Wapter's interest in literature and the arts, and because I did not think it fair to rely solely upon my reading, I have taken the liberty of securing her opinion. These are serious and difficult questions to which Mrs. Wapter and I would like you to give just one hour of your time. Sincerely yours, Leopold Wapter. P.S. If you have not yet seen the Broadway production of The Diary of Anne Frank, I strongly advise that you do so. Mrs. Wapter and I were in the audience on opening night. We wish that Nathan Zuckerman could have been with us to benefit from that unforgettable experience. I am also sending separately to you a hardcover copy of the diary itself. If you've read it once, read it again. If you haven't read it, let me remind you of a little European history. We should remind a lot of people of a little European history. In July 1942, some two years after the Nazi occupation had begun, a Jewish businessman in Amsterdam took his wife and two young daughters into hiding. That man's name was Otto Frank. Along with another Jewish family, the Franks lived safely for 25 months in the rear upper story of the Amsterdam building where he used to have his business offices. Then, in August 1944, their whereabouts were apparently betrayed by one of the workers in the warehouse below, and the hideout was uncovered by the police. Of the eight who had been together in the sealed off attic rooms, only the father survived the concentration camps. 
Ten questions for Nathan Zuckerman. Only ten. One. If you had been living in Nazi Germany in the 30s, would you have written your story? Two. Do you believe Shakespeare, Shylock, and Dickens, Fagan have been of no use to anti-Semites? Three. Do you practice Judaism? Does he? Look, wait a minute. Does he? Not exactly. If so, how? If not, what credentials qualify you to write about Jewish life for national magazines? Maybe three's enough. Four, would you claim that the characters in your story represent a fair sample of the kinds of people that make up a typical contemporary community of Jews? Five. The judge only meant what had happened to the Jews could have in happened Europe, anywhere. In Europe, not in Newark. We are not the wretched victims of Belson. We are not the victims of that crime. But we could be. In their place, we would be. Violence isn't new to Jews. Ma, you want to see physical violence done to the Jews of Newark? Go to the office of the plastic surgeon where the girls get their noses fixed. That's where the Jewish blood flows in Essex County. That's where the blow is delivered, and with a mallet to their bones and to their pride. Please don't, I'm not up to all this shouting, not from your father or from you. Read this, read it aloud. Read number 10. Well, I will not read it aloud. Judge Wafter obviously doesn't mean that you are Goebbels, dear. He was only a little shocked from your story. Oh, well maybe he shocks a little too easily. Jews are heirs to greater shocks than I can possibly deliver with this story. Please, dear, don't ignore the judge. Write him something just to satisfy your father. Nothing I could write to Judge Wapter could possibly convince him of anything. You could tell him you went to see the diary of Anne Frank. I didn't see it. You read the book. Everybody read the book. Ma, I have to go work. But you liked it, didn't you? The book? Mother, I will not prate in platitudes to please the adults. Six, what set of aesthetic values makes you think that the cheap is more valid than the noble and the slimy is more truthful than the sublime? I wonder if Amy will take the job. Amy won't take the job. Has she told you she won't? Can you honestly say that there is anything in your short story that would not warm the heart of a Julius Streicher or a Joseph Goebbels? My father and the judge claimed I had maligned and misrepresented the Jews, of which I was one, of which, only some 5,000 days past, there had been millions more. There would be Goyim only too pleased to call us all kikes because of what I had written for the whole world to read about a family of Jews fighting over money. In Lanoff's study that night, I began letter after letter explaining myself to my father. I could not finish one.
A refugee, Lanoff had said. Displaced. Some early misfortune. Was it that I had seen in her? Something vital lost, beaten down. A girl to be rescued and brought back to life. A girl in a trance. Now you're being sensible. You had to see for yourself, and so you saw. I saw nothing. Only more missing you either way. He is ruining everyone's life. You go to sleep. We must talk. We've talked. And don't blame her for what you hold against me. I'm the one who says no around here. I love you so, Dada. There's no one else like you. You're a good girl. You'll be fine now. You're the great survivor. Oh, am I? Sing to me, Dada. So I ups to him, and he ups to me. <laughs> More. Thing I can do without Broadway. Oh, I know darn well I can do without Broadway, but can Broadway do without me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we could be so happy. In Florence, Dada. We could come out of hiding. We are not in hiding. We never have been. Don't worry, I wouldn't be your wife in Florence. I'd still be your little girl. Stop dreaming. If only she would go. Do you want a corpse on your conscience? She'd be dead in a year. I have a corpse on my conscience. Cover yourself. My corpse. Look. Melodrama, Amy, cover up. You prefer tragedy? convincing. Decide not to lose hold and then don't. But living there while you live here, I'm going crazy. My dear girl, you know what you must do. Yes. Give things up. Oh, Manny. Would it kill you just to kiss my breasts? Cover yourself. Dada. Please. Bellette. Bellette. Who is this 
Bellette. And why does she look at you as though she's in hiding? This is the story that the 26-year-old woman with the striking face and the fetching accent and the felicitous prose style and the patience, according to Lanoff, of a Lanoff. This is the story that she expected him to believe was true. That face. A.F.'s face, shattered eyes innocently uplifted, the same musing look. Amy had gone alone to New York to sit amid the weeping and inconsolable audience at the Broadway production of The Diary of Anne Frank. And this is the story that she expected Lanoff to believe was true. Benny, you have to come. I just saw a play, and I, I can't talk to him. You have to come, please. I'm at the Biltmore Hotel. I know, I know who I am now. We have to talk. Please, Manny, come. I know darn well I can do without Broadway, but can Broadway do without me? No, no! It was watching the play that did it. It were all those people all around me. All these women, they were all in tears. And then suddenly at the end, this woman in the row behind me started screaming, oh no. It wasn't for me. That's when I came running here. You see, I wanted to be in a room where I could stay until I found my father. But then if I told them, you see, then they'd have to come out onto the stage every night after the performance and tell the people it, that it's all right, that she's really alive. I couldn't do that to them. Annie, I can't tell him. Can't talk to him. I can't tell anyone. Now I have to be dead. If A.B. were A.F., 
or thought she was, or was. It wasn't strange that she was thought to have died. It wasn't strange that I was thought to be dead. The Allies were bombing everywhere. The SS was in flight. It was chaos in the end. It was worse than chaos. I was in a coma. And then the carpos carted me away to some filthy barracks for sick children. to impress the Allied forces when they arrived with the amenities of concentration camp living. Then the British moved us to an army field hospital. That was where I came around. I told them in the hospital that my name was Amy Ballet. Ballet? because until she finally spoke, the nurses called the silent, dark, emaciated girl, Little Beauty. Amy? Amy I got from an American book that I had sobbed over as a child, Little Women. She had decided during her long silence to finish growing up in America now that there was nobody left to live with in Amsterdam. Hi, Amy. So with luck and E.I. Lonov's help, I put an ocean the size of the Atlantic between myself and what I needed to forget. One day, she picked up an old copy of Time in the college lounge, and it was there that she learned of her father's survival. Dutch readers, it said, were greatly affected by the young teenager's record of how the hunted Jews tried to carry on a civilized life despite their deprivations and the terror of discovery. No, it wasn't strange that she was thought to be dead. The strange, improbable part of Amy's story was this that she did not telephone Time magazine and say, I'm the one who wrote the diary. Find Otto Frank. I had been dead to my father for more than four years. So believing me dead for another month or so wouldn't really hurt much more. Curious. I didn't hurt more either. Except in bed at night. In bed, I begged forgiveness. Exactly for what? For the cruelty that I was practicing on my perfect father. Once she knew of its existence, she sent a money order to Holland for a copy of Anne Frank's book. Three weeks later, the package came from Amsterdam. Forbearance, she thought. Patience. Without patience, there is no life. Von Anna Frank. Her book. Hers. It was the only book that I read for weeks. I couldn't believe that I had written it in as little more than a child. How nice I thought if I could write like this for Mr. Lonov's English 12. How nice to hear Mr. Lonov say, good Miss Ballet, the best you've ever done. Het is een gek verschijnsel. 
dat ik mij soms zie als door de ogen van een ander. I have an odd way of sometimes, as it were, being able to see myself through someone else's eyes. Then I view the affairs of a certain Anne at my ease and browse through the pages of her life as if she were a stranger. There is nothing we can do but wait as calmly as we can till the misery comes to an end. Jews and Christians wait, the whole earth waits, and there are many who wait for death. Eens zullen we toch weer mensen en niet alleen Joden zijn. The time will come when we are people again and not just Jews. May 3rd, 1944. I'm young and I possess many buried qualities. I'm young and strong and I'm living a great adventure. And two days later, May 5th, 1944, to the father whose favorite living creature she had always longed to be, a declaration of her independence. Independence, as she bluntly put it, in mind and body. I have now reached the stage that I can live entirely on my own, without mummy's support or anyone else's for that matter. I don't feel in the least bit responsible to any of you. I don't have to give an account of my deeds to anyone but myself. She tried to understand the meaning of their persecution. One moment writing about the misery of being Jews and only Jews to their enemies. And in the next, airily wondering, page 109, were the diary of Anne Frank known to be the work of a living writer, it would never be more than a young teenager's diary of her trying years in hiding during the German occupation of Holland something boys and girls could read in bed at night along with the adventures of the Swiss family Robinson. But dead, she had something more to offer than amusement for ages 10 to 15. Dead, she had written a book without meaning to or trying to, a book with the force of a masterpiece to make people finally see. See what? They weep for me. They pity me. They pray for me. They beg my forgiveness. I'm the incarnation of the millions of unlived years robbed from the murdered Jews. It's too late to be alive now. I'm their saint. Pathetic, you must think. What a joke. A joke? On whom? I don't see the joke. Am I telling this to you? Yes, but I still don't get the joke. It's like one of your stories. An E.I. Lonoff story called... I suppose you'd know what to call it. You'd know how to tell it in three pages. This homeless girl comes from Europe, sits in the professor's class, being very clever, listens to his records, and virtually grows up in his home. And then suddenly one day, when the waif is a woman, suddenly this fine day in the Biltmore Hotel, she casually announces to you,
Yes, quite casually. Oh, Manny. I'm not a lunatic. I'm not a crackpot. I'm not just some girl, you must believe me, trying to be interesting and imitate your art. My dear child, if all this is so... Oh, Dad, I'm afraid it really is. Well, then you've left my poor art far behind. Do you know why I took this sweet name? It was to protect me from my memories. From hating people the way people hate spiders and rats. I felt flayed. I felt as if my face had been peeled away and people would stare in horror for the rest of my life. Until the book. The package came from Amsterdam, and there it was. My past, myself, my name, my face intact. And all I wanted was revenge. I wanted their Christian tears to run like Jewish blood for me. I wanted their pity, and in the most pitiless way, and I wanted love, to be loved mercilessly, endlessly, just the way I'd been debased. Manny, I want to be your Anne Frank now, not theirs. I have to be. I want to go home with you to Europe. This summer I saw a stone villa for rent up on a hillside outside of Florence. To be there, just looking after you, listening to music together, making meals, wearing lovely nightgowns to bed. Does it really matter that I'm your daughter's age, that you're my father's? Love has to start somewhere. And that's where it starts in us. As for who I am, well, you have to be somebody, don't you? Of course, Lanoff told Hope nothing about who Amy thought she was. He didn't have to. He could guess what she would say if he did, that it was for him, the great writer, that Amy had chosen to become Anne Frank, to enchant him, to bewitch him, to break into his imagination, and there, as Anne Frank, to become E.I. Lanoff's femme fatale. The next morning, 
Amy was to return to her old job back in Cambridge, and I was to leave for the writer's colony at Quasse. Amy Billette was going away, and Mrs. Lonoff was a new woman. I eat too much. It's exercise you need. Sitting at that desk that does it. You gave up your afternoon walk. Oh, I can't face another walk. I can't face those trees again. Then walk in the other direction. For 10 years, I've walked in the other direction. That's why I started walking in this direction. I'm not even walking when I'm walking. The truth is, I don't even see the trees. That's not true. He loves nature. I met a marvelous young woman while I was up in New England. I love her, and she loves me. We are going to be married. Married? But so fast. Nathan, they ask. Is she Jewish? She is. Who wants to split an egg with me? Why did you treat yourself to a whole egg this morning? Amy, do you want to split an egg with me? I couldn't. Only half. Not even a sixteenth. Here's your egg. Well, I only wanted half. Darling, feast for once. Egg, butter, toast. The works. Remember those shadowed eyes? Well, this is she. This is my wife. Anne, says my father. The Anne. That's all right, darling. I'll do it. The publisher forwards everything, unfortunately. I mean, used to look at this stuff until the end of the day. Couldn't even look at it now. He wouldn't even eat breakfast with us until a few years ago, but when the children were gone, I refused to sit here by myself. Anyone mind? Let me make you another egg. Oh, I'm full, darling. <laughs> it has style. He just puts out the line and hangs up the wash. Read it out, Hopi, for Nathan's edification. I have just finished your brilliant story, Indiana. What do you know about the Middle West, you little Jewish shit? Your Jew omniscience is about as agreeable to the average person as is your kite sense of art. Signed, Sally M. Fort Wayne. Isn't that nice? Dear Mom and Dad, we have been with Anne's father for three days now. They have both been in the most moving state of exultation since our arrival. New Delhi. You've been made a Brahmin. He won't accept. Well, maybe he's in luck and they made him an untouchable. Oh, yes, he'd like that. Or less. You can't have everything. Dear sir, I am a 22-year-old youth from India. I introduce myself as there is no other way to make your acquaintance. Perhaps you may not relish the idea of being acquainted with a stranger who is bent on exploiting you. If my educational qualification disqualifies me from entering America. Go on. From entering America as a student, and if all other means fail, will you adopt me as the last resort? I'm sorry. Why should you be sorry? It's not my letter. I never said it was. Never mind, forget it. I'm going now. Oh, must you? Without finishing your coffee? You're half an hour behind schedule already. What with all this promiscuous socializing over your egg? <clears throat> well, suit yourself. If you could drop me in town. Stay in touch. And thanks for the help. I've got each of the books separated out, so at least that's in order. Fine. The rest I'll have to see to myself. 
and think about. I'm not really sure. On behalf of the Harvard University Library, I beseech you, don't destroy anything. One moment. Excuse me. Dear folks, Anne is pregnant. Happier, she says, than she ever thought possible again. The past is over. She's happy. I really must be going now. Last night he told me about a letter you'd written to him from England. Was that why you were still living in England? Oh, my. I introduce myself as there is no other way to make your acquaintance. Hope this won't do. Let's all have what we want, please. Uh, where had you been before England? Uh, that's a long story. You'd been through the war? I missed the war. How so? Luck. I suppose that's how I missed it, too. What did you have instead? My childhood. What did you have instead? Somebody else's. I think perhaps you should go, Mr. Zuckerman. Shouldn't we say goodbye to the Lanoffs? I thought we had. He helped you to come to America? Yes. Pardon me for insisting, it's just... You bear some resemblance to Anne Frank. Not really. No, I'm afraid I'm not she. You've read her book. Not really. I looked at it. Oh, it's quite a book. Is it? She was a marvelous young writer. It's something watching her mastering things at 13. You must read it. Suddenly she's discovering reflection. Suddenly there's portraiture, character sketches. Suddenly there's a long, intricate, eventful happening. It's so beautifully recounted, it seems to have gone through a dozen drafts. And I was thinking, she's like some impassioned little sister of Kafka's. His lost little daughter. A kinship is even there in the face. Kafka's garrets and closets, the hidden attics where they hand down the indictments, camouflage doors. Everything he dreamed in Prague was to her real Amsterdam life. What he invented, she suffered. This is hardly what you want. It's what I've wanted for years. You don't know what you're saying. <laughs> You're just frightened of losing your boredom. You're worried about how you're going to get all your writing done and all your reading done and all your brooding done without the boredom of me. Well, let someone else be boring for you from now on. Let someone else be no trouble. Hope, please come back up here. Hope. Take off your coat. Now you are going to have your 35 years of it. Oh, this is play acting, pure indulgence. I am going. Oh, but don't worry, she knows where everything is. She can hang her things back in the closet and be ready to begin boring you as soon as I'm out of the door. You won't even notice the difference, Manny. Oh, she thinks otherwise. Of course she does. I've seen her fondling each sheet of each draft of each story. She thinks with her it'll all be the religion of art up here. Oh, will it ever. Let her try to please you, Manny. Let her serve as a backdrop for your thoughts for the next 35 years. Let her cook the things you like to make you happy and then see the look on your stone face when you come in at night and sit down at the table. Have a run hot baths for your poor back twice a day and then go a week without being talked to, let alone touched in bed. Ask him. In bed? What is it, dear? What's the matter? You'll know what the matter is. You'll know why he won't hold you, why he doesn't even know you're there. The 50th draft. That is enough. Very thorough, quite accurate, and enough. 
Take that damn coat off. The classroom daydream has come true. You get the creative writer, and I get to go. She is not staying. You are staying. I am going to Boston. I am going to Europe. I am taking a trip around the world and never coming back. And you won't go anywhere. You won't see anything. Not living is what he makes his beautiful fiction out of, and now you will be the person he is not living with. I'm going. I'm going. I'm leaving now. If you would like a ride to town. I'm leaving now. Oh, take that silly hat off. School is over. You are 27. This is officially your house. It's not home. <laughs> it's yours. Little bitch. You want me to do anything? Calm down, Nathan. One at a time, we are about to calm down. Mrs. Lanoff's fallen down. I see that. The battery. Maybe she's flooded it. No, it's the battery. You charge it up, it makes no difference. Maybe you need a new one. There's a new one. Well, just as well it doesn't work. From whose point of view, Nathan? Again, you're going to get hurt. Darling, it's slippery. It's cold as hell. I am going to Boston. I'll walk if I have to. Hope, it is five degrees below zero. Now, calm down, come inside, have a cup of tea, and then we'll talk about moving to Boston. Manny, you wouldn't even go down to the college because the streets are paved. So how could I ever get you to go to Boston? How could you concentrate in Boston? Somebody there might even dare to ask you something about your work. Well, then maybe it's best to stay here after all. Here? Here I can't even make toast in the kitchen. Here I have to catch the toast before it pops out so you don't have to be disturbed in the study. You're overdoing it. Don't catch it. For the next 35 years, just make your toast and forget about me. I can't. Learn. <laughs> it's like being married to Tolstoy. Would you like me to come along? No need. I can use the exercise after my egg. Besides, you must have things to write down. There's paper on my desk. Paper for what? For your feverish notes. You had an earful this morning. No, it wasn't so much. So much as what? Last night? I'll be curious to see how we all turn out someday. Should make an interesting story. You're not so nice and polite in your fiction. You're a different person. Am I? I should hope so.
Can you want somebody who writes this kind of story and then pretends it's the truth? Not so nice and polite in your fiction. You're a different person. Am I? <laughs>